Nine days of shelling, 17 people killed, eight Indians and nine Pakistanis. Welcome to the news tonight on Rajya Sabha Television. My name is Zaka Jacob. First up, a look at the top stories that we're tracking tonight. 17 civilians are dead so far as the war rhetoric escalates on both sides of the border. Arun Jaitley says India will respond aggressively to the Pakistani shelling. With less than a week to go for polling, political parties unleashed their big guns for campaigning both in Maharashtra and Haryana. Odisha and Andhra Pradesh brace for cyclone Hood Hood. Storm gathers strength after causing havoc in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And a day after the first Ebola patient dies in the United States, the World Bank admits that the global response to the epidemic has failed miserably. It warns that the crisis is only going to spread. Our top story tonight. Today is day nine in the standoff at the border, a day in which more than five civilians were injured in the cross-border firing between India and Pakistan. Meanwhile, both the Prime Minister and the Defence Minister had strong words for Pakistan. Defence Minister Arun Jaitley warning Pakistan that it will have to pay an unaffordable price for the violence. The Minister's statement, though, was met with a high-pitched rebuttal by his Pakistani counterpart. <laughs> On a day when five more civilians were injured in the cross-border firing between India and Pakistan, Defence Minister Arun Jaitley warned Pakistan it will pay an unaffordable price for the violence. Pakistan in these attacks has clearly been the aggressor, but it must realise that our deterrence will be credible. If Pakistan persists with this adventurism, our forces will make the cost of this adventurism unaffordable. Jaitley's Pakistani counterpart responded with equally stern words, even reminding India that the conflict between two nuclear powers shouldn't be allowed to go out of hand. Jaitley's remarks of a strong response came a day after Prime Minister Narendra Modi said an end could be in sight for the violence. Nine Pakistani and eight Indians have been killed so far, in over a week of fighting. Okay. Jaitley said the cross-border fighting was an attempt to infiltrate militants. There is a connection between firing and infiltration. It was also an effort by Pakistan to precipitate tension where none existed. Opposition leaders say when India's response needs to be not only an effective deterrent, but also an attempt at finding a lasting solution to the problem. Telling Pakistan in no uncertain terms, without any ambiguity, but with firmness, that Indian response to this provocation will be firm, will be adequate, and will be an effective deterrent. It is necessary that the Indian government and the Pakistani government talk and see that the ceasefire is maintained and the violation stop. For that, whatever is necessary should be done. Nearly 20,000 people are reported to have fled their homes in Jammu and are taking refuge in schools and relief camps. On Thursday, Aknu residents took stock of the damage. तो ये काफी ज्यादा नुकसान हुआ गांव को कुछ उधर भी गिरे हैं पशु पशुओं को भी लगी है और दो तीन बंदे भी घायल हुए हैं वी आर ट्राइंग टू मिनिमाइज द कैजुअलिटीज एंड वी आर डूइंग दैट बाय इवैक्यूएटिंग एरियाज अलोंग द इंटरनेशनल बॉर्डर विद आई बिलीव अ फेयर डिग्री ऑफ सक्सेस इंडियन फोर्सेस रिटैलिएटेड टू गन फायर एंड मॉर्टर शेल्स ऑन अबाउट 50 बॉर्डर सिक्योरिटी पोस्ट्स ओवरनाइट while sporadic gunfire is nothing new in the area, the widespread fighting and the number of civilian deaths has unnerved local residents. Bar bar, we have to leave our home and go out. School, colleges, we have to camp. So we can't attend school there. That's why the study is very difficult here. In New Delhi, protests were held outside the Pakistani High Commission. The cross-border skirmishes are the most intense in over a decade, having increased exponentially in the last couple of months. 
They also mark Modi's first defence crisis since becoming Prime Minister in May. The violence also coincides with the end to the weeks of anti-government protest in Pakistan, as well as the assembly elections in Maharashtra and Haryana. Bureau report, Raj Sabha TV. Meanwhile, a day after the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki Moon asked India and Pakistan to resolve their issues diplomatically through dialogue, an American Senator, Timothy M. Cain, has suggested that the UN could be a helpful participant in resolving this crisis. Now, Mr. Cain is the chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on South and Central Asian Affairs. He said the UN could help restore what now appears to be a broken ceasefire. I think sometimes the UN can be a, a, a helpful participant in a discussion to return to, to the ceasefire, for example. So the Secretary General's comments about that were, I thought, appropriate. Um, the, the right role or the necessity of how deep the UN needs to be engaged, I haven't really thought that through. But as a, as a promoter of peaceful resolution of disputes, the UN uh, does a good job at that. And, and, and in that sense, I think their, their participation should be welcome. Not sure if there will be too many takers in the Indian establishment for that suggestion. Thanks, but no thanks. All right, we're shifting focus here on the program from bullets and mortar shells to all the dust and dirt from the campaign trail less than a week to go for Verdict 2014. On the campaign trail in Maharashtra today, it was time for the big guns to face off. Both Narendra Modi and Sonia Gandhi crossed swords for the first time this election season. Narendra Modi was in NCP chief Sharad Pawar's home turf, Baramati. He accused Mr. Pawar of being a failure as agriculture minister in the previous government. During Pawar's tenure, Modi alleged more than 30,000 farmers in Maharashtra had committed suicide. Not to be left behind, Congress President Sonia Gandhi accused Modi and the BJP of spreading hatred in the country given the rising number of communal incidents ever since the BJP came to power. Partita. It was a clash of the political stalwarts in Maharashtra on Thursday. Statewide rallies were held by the top leaders including Prime Minister Narendra Modi, Congress President Sonia Gandhi, Home Minister Rajnath Singh, BJP President Amit Shah and BSP Supremo Mayawati. Prime Minister Modi continued with his whirlwind campaign in the state. The highlight was his rally at Baramati, which is the family bastion of NCP Chief Sharad Pawar. Modi launched a scathing attack on the NCP Congress Alliance that was in power for 15 years. He accused the former UPA government of misgovernance. He also replied to opposition's charges on his silence over ceasefire violations by Pakistan. Congress President Sonia Gandhi too campaigned extensively for her party in Kolhapur and Aurangabad. In her poll speech, Sonia accused the BJP of spreading hatred in the society. With just a few days left for the polls, top BJP leaders like Rajnath Singh and Amit Shah also campaigned in Maharashtra trying to woo voters. BSP Supremo Mayawati also addressed rallies in Solapur and Pune. Her party is contesting alone on almost all seats, both in Maharashtra and Haryana. 
Bureau Report, Raj Sabha TV. Meanwhile, a day after launching his campaign in Maharashtra, Congress Vice President Rahul Gandhi turned his attention to Haryana today. Addressing three rallies, he accused the BJP government of only appeasing industrialists while forgetting the common man. Praising the achievements of sportspersons from the state, Rahul coined a new slogan for Haryana, Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, Jai Pehlwan. With only a few days left for the forthcoming assembly polls in Haryana, Congress Vice President Rahul Gandhi had a hectic day of campaigning in the state. He addressed three rallies on Thursday, his highest so far in this election season. Continuing from where he left off in Maharashtra, Rahul Gandhi was severe in his criticism of the BJP-led government at the centre. Rahul Gandhi was accompanied by Haryana Chief Minister Bhupendra Singh Hudda during his rallies. For the second time in as many days, he questioned Prime Minister's silence on ceasefire violations. Rahul Gandhi also had words of praise for internationally acclaimed sportspersons belonging to the state. He coined a new slogan for Haryana, referring to the contribution of farmers, soldiers and sportspersons from the state. Rahul Gandhi also accused the BJP government at the centre of working to dilute welfare initiatives brought in by Congress like the Land Acquisition Act and Manrega. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. And in case you want more election-related buzz and stories from the campaign trail, you can watch our special election bulletin, Verdict 2014, every day at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. here on Rajasabha TV. Prime Minister Narendra Modi also addressed the fourth Global Investors Summit in Indore today. He said job creation will be his government's topmost priority. And to, to that end, he indicated that public-private partnership will be encouraged in the days to come. Prime Minister Modi also underscored a healthy relationship between the states and centre to attain what he called, and I quote him here, unimaginable results. Modi also applauded Madhya Pradesh for becoming one of the fastest growing economies in the country. <laughs> You know, here's all the other news and updates that made the news tonight in our special segment, Nationwide. Former Tamil Nadu Chief Minister J. Jayalalitha moved to Supreme Court for bail in the disproportionate assets case. This after the Karnataka High Court denied her bail Tuesday. The AIADMK chief has been in jail since the 27th of September after she was convicted by a trial court in Bangalore. Jayalalitha faces four years in prison and needs to pay 100 crores as fine. The BSE Sensex surged 390 points to close at a one-week high, 26,637 at close. The NSE Nifty rising 117 points to its highest level in four days, 79.60. Stockbrokers say trading sentiment was boosted by the news that the US Federal Reserve is unlikely to raise interest rates anytime soon. The centre has given state governments six more months to implement the Food Security Act. The law entitles two-thirds of the country's population to subsidised food grains. State governments were to implement the law by the 4th of July this year, a year after it was enacted. The deadline was extended by three months as many states didn't put in place the necessary infrastructure.
11 states have implemented the law so far. The Delhi BJP invited nine prominent people, including former AAP leader Shazia Ilmi, to take part in the Clean India campaign. Wrestler Sushil Kumar and Delhi University Vice Chancellor Dinesh Singh are among some of the other personalities who will be part of this campaign. Cyclone Hood Hood has moved closer to the coast of Odisha and Andhra Pradesh Thursday. The storm gathered force on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, leaving in its wake a trail of destruction. There have been massive landslides, homes have been destroyed, trees uprooted. The Met Department is expecting a severe cyclonic storm to cross the North Andhra Pradesh coast around Vishakhapatnam. They're expecting this to happen by Sunday. With the cyclonic storm Hood Hood gathering force on Thursday, the Met Department issued warnings of heavy rainfall along the coasts of Andhra Pradesh and South Odisha. Hood Hood has moved into a west northwest direction from the east central bay of Bengal. It will cross the north Andhra Pradesh coast near Vishakhapatnam by Sunday afternoon. Cyclonic storm over Bay of Bengal has moved west northwest directions and it was lying about 780 kilometers southeast of Gopalpur. Disaster management preparations have been stepped up in the cyclone-prone districts of both states. Odisha Chief Minister Naveen Patnaik has sought help from the Air Force if the need arises. Today I've reviewed the contingency plans of important de departments like water resources, energy, food and civil supplies, and works. Our team is ready position, ready to deploy. Twelve teams have been deployed from Mundeli. We can be able to get other battalions from the battalion. Panic-struck villagers in the coastal regions, meanwhile, are scrambling to pile up food and essential items. It's scary. What's it scary? It's scary. 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 What will you do? What will you do? It's scary. 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 Cabinet Secretary Ajit Seth also reviewed the preparedness to meet any eventuality from the cyclone in the two states. The centre has also issued guidelines to the state administrations. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. All right, we're going to take a break here on the programme. When we return, guess who's visiting India? Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is in the country. He'll be meeting with Prime Minister Modi tomorrow. What does he want and how can India help? We'll focus on that when the news tonight returns. Welcome back to the news tonight. The CEO and co-founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, is in India for the first time. He attended the Internet.org summit. He's scheduled to meet with Prime Minister Narendra Modi tomorrow. Zuckerberg says he plans to discuss with the Prime Minister ways to connect villages with the digital world. He's on his first trip to this country. India has the second largest number of Facebook users after the United States. He is the third high-profile CEO of an American technology firm in recent days to visit India after Amazon's Jeff Bezos and Microsoft's Satya Nadella. When you bring internet to a country like India, you're not just helping the people who don't have access to the internet today, you really are improving the world for everyone else too. Because you know, the, the person who doesn't have the tools that they need to go build that company and bring that idea to the world that's going to help people in all these other countries now have those tools or ha ha has those tools. And that's just a really profound thing, that if we can play some small role in making that happen, um, that's a huge deal. All right, just a little over 12% of Indians have access to the internet. What brings somebody like Mark Zuckerberg to India? We're joined uh, here in our studios by Madhavan Narayanan. He's a senior associate editor of the Hindustan Times newspaper. Thanks for joining us here on the news tonight. Uh, this is, I believe, the second biggest market for Facebook after the United States. And yet, Facebook derives, according to some estimates, less than 1% of its revenues from the Indian market. Why would Mark Zuckerberg want to visit India? India is about the future. So uh, let's not talk the revenues now. Let's talk about the uh, revenues in future, the prospects in future. So if you take a look at the context, India has right now 108 million Facebook users out of a connectivity of around 243 million. That's not a mean number. The best way to understand this would be that how would you compare Mark Zuckerberg with, let's say, Rupert Murdoch, the media baron? Mm -hmm. And I would put Zuckerberg 
miles ahead of any Indian media baron. <laughs> Forget about Rupert Murdoch, who doesn't even have full access to the Indian market. Uh, except that the content is generated by the millions of users, such as you and me, putting up status updates and other content. Yeah. So but the real issue, therefore, is not just access. The, it's all about the eyeballs for advertisement. But you refer to you and me, Mr. Narayan, but the fact is we are a tiny minority. I mean, this country, even today, has just about a little over 12% uh, people having access to the internet, intrinsically linked with Facebook becoming bigger than what it is in India uh, as, of, as of now, is digital penetration. I Where does the government stand on that? And, and is it even possible to achieve the targets that the government has set out for itself? I think it's important to understand two things. One is that 108 million is no mean number. It's still 10% of India's most influential population, which mm -hmm. has tremendous social clout and purchasing power. And therefore, I wouldn't dismiss it of its significance. But if you were to look at it socially, you're absolutely right. You have a larger population waiting to be connected. 900 million mo mobile connections already exist in India. And therefore... It's almost like I was joking, you know, it's like converting a hockey penalty corner into a goal. You have 900 million mobile phones already, nine connections, and 243 million internet connections through desktop and mm -hmm. mobile both, and about 150 million smartphones. Now, what we need to watch out for is the way the next, uh, from uh, 150 million, how much close to 900 million every phone becomes as a smartphone or what Zuckerberg wants is a smart feature phone, which yes. is, has elements of a smartphone. It has limited internet access. So, so tell me a little bit about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Here you have, I mean, today you can buy a smartphone or a, or a, a version of a smartphone for 5,000 Indian rupees. Mm -hmm. uh, the point is, how, how soon do you see that gap between 150 million smartphone users, a large number of them in urban centers like Delhi and Mumbai and, and the big cities of this country, how soon do you see that 150 million reach closer to the 900 million? Uh, I mean, we've, this country has gone through a cell phone revolution. How soon before we go through a smartphone revolution? Yeah, smartphone revolution is much closer than you think. Let me take you back. In the, as Facebook announced today that in 2011, uh, it had only 11 million users in India. Now it's already 108. So it's grown tenfold in about, let's say, of, uh, three, four years. The other more important thing is that 900 million data is not just urban, it is rural. So let's also talk rural. Mm -hmm. And it's important to understand that this figure of 150 million will probably double in, in my opinion, less than three years. Okay. Because uh, smartphones are getting cheaper and cheaper. And I foresee a future, I've been sticking my neck out and talking about this. The day is not far off when smartphones will be probably given away. It's already happening, even today, if you look at the Diwali sales, there are some elementary phones being uh, sold free with TV. And so very soon you'll have smartphones being bundled with content and people will buy content and get smartphone free. Uh, right right, now, I, just, I just want to add a, I, I don't know if it's a dissenting note, but uh, the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus, which haven't come to India yet, uh, by some estimates, more than 60,000 bucks. That, that, that would be more than the average salary of the working Indian. But thanks for joining us, Madhavan Narayan. Yeah, I He's think it's important to remember not to compare a luxury car with a nano. All right, <laughs> point taken, point taken. We'll have to leave it at that for the paucity of time. Thanks for joining us, Madhavan Narayan, Thank you. Senior Associate Editor from the Hindustan Times. Now, it is, of course, uh, an increasingly interconnected world. What, what with technology doing wonders uh, to your life and mine, but it's also an increasingly vulnerable world. One of the things that uh, has struck the world uh, uh, in a major way over the last uh, few months or so is the Ebola virus. And today, for the first time, the World Bank has admitted that the global response to this epidemic has failed miserably. It's now warning that the crisis faced by the U.S. and Spain is only going to get worse in the coming days. Spain, in fact, has quarantined three more people today who are suspected to be carrying this virus. The United States has stepped up measures to contain the epidemic by launching a massive precautionary measure. The spread of Ebola epidemic beyond African nations has now become a cause of concern. The World Bank chief, Jim Kim, said that the international community has failed miserably to tackle the crisis effectively. He has sought another $20 billion fund at a time when the disease has fueled fear of Western pandemic. Every day that we don't put money into stopping the crisis is many, many more dollars and pounds that we're going to have to use later. It is an extremely good investment right now to prevent this kind of loss, to, to put all the money on the table right now to get the response going. Spain has quarantined three more people suspected of carrying the virus. 
This includes a doctor who was treating a Spanish nurse, the first person to contact the deadly virus outside of Africa. The health official said the nurse infected herself by touching her face with contaminated gloves. Como si Teresa es cierto que ha tenido ese pequeño accidente que se ha rozado la cara y se ha podido contaminar, como si se ha aplicado el protocolo estrictamente y el protocolo exige estrictamente que haya unos observadores tanto a la puesta del equipo. Altogether, about 80 people are being monitored in Spain to see if they develop symptoms of Ebola. United States has also stepped up precautionary measures to prevent the disease from spreading further. The country recorded its first death to the deadly virus in Texas. A second person quarantined in Dallas is said to be a low-risk patient. Authorities have launched stringent screenings at U.S. airports, but it's said it doesn't guarantee zero risk of Ebola spreading further. What we're doing is putting in additional protection. Uh, we've been very clear that as long as Ebola continues to spread in Africa, we can't make the risk zero here. We wish we could. The World Bank has warned that the disease could get worse in U.S. and Spain in the coming days. Ebola has already claimed close to 4,000 lives in West African nations. The World Health Organization said further sporadic cases of Ebola in Europe were now inevitable. Bureau Report, Raj Sabha TV. Now, from the fight against Ebola to the fight against the Islamic State, the town of Kobani is swinging between the control of local Kurdish forces on the one hand and the IS militants. Now, despite air support from the US-led coalition, Kurdish forces are slowly but surely losing grip over the strategic border town. Undeterred by the airstrikes, militants of the IS have now been pressing ahead with continuous counter-strikes. This is daily life in Kobani. Explosion after explosion after explosion. And this has been going on for the last three weeks straight. This time, the intensity was so huge, plumes of black smoke were visible from the other side of the border in Turkey. Despite a heavy onslaught by US-led jets, IS militants have reportedly recaptured more than a third of this small but strategic town. The Turkish tanks on the frontier have simply been mute spectators, something that's not lost on the fighters here. Askerle girsin, kara harekatı yapsın, izin versin, izin versin biz girelim. The unrest in Turkey has been the fallout of the war in Syria and Iraq. Turkey's prime minister says his country cannot be expected to lead a ground operation against the Islamic State on its own. Bütün vatandaşlarımız sükunete ve devletinden ve hükümetinin gücünden emin olarak olayları yakından takip etmeye davet ediyorum. Sakın ola ki birilerinin istediği tarzda bir kargaşa veya karamsar ortama sürüklenmeyin. NATO is yet to take up Turkey's proposals for a no-fly zone or even a safe zone inside Syria. But the NATO chief had some reassuring words for the alliance partner. We will always be ready uh, to uh, support Turkey in uh, defending uh, itself because that's part of the, uh, the alliance and it's part of the collective security which the alliance is uh, built on. And from the man who started this offensive in the first place against the Islamic State, another reminder to be prepared for the long haul. Our strikes continue uh, alongside our partners. It remains a difficult mission. Uh, as I've indicated from the start, this is not something that is going to be uh, solved overnight. Uh, the good news is, is that there is a broad-based consensus, uh, not just in the region, but among uh, nations of the world, that ISIL is a threat to world peace, security and order. After two protracted wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the Americans are understandably wary of sending ground troops to fight IS. But can a terrorist organization, described as worse than Al-Qaeda, be defeated only by this barrage from the air? It'll be some while yet before we know the answer to that one. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. And we'll be keeping a close eye in what is now becoming the global fight against the Islamic State. That's a wrap of the news tonight, this Thursday edition. From me, Zaka Jacob, and the rest of the team, thanks for your time. We'll catch you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.